Dr. Sage here, back with a second in the video series on the introduction to chemistry. This time, what we're going to focus on is learning about chemical bonds. Right, where we left off last time was essentially talking about electrons and how they fill the electron shells and the fact that all an atom wants in their life is to have a filled outermost electron shell, which is called the valence electron shell. And what atoms are going to do is they're going to form chemical bonds with other atoms in order to try to fill their valence electron shell. How they're going to do that is by either sharing electrons with other atoms or transferring electrons between atoms. Now when they do this, they either share electrons or transfer electrons. Those atoms tend to stay stuck to each other, and that's what a chemical bond is. Now there's different types of chemical bonds, and we're going to learn about four types of chemical bonds today. The first type we're going to learn about is called the covalent bond. The covalent bond is when atoms share valence electrons in order to try to fill their valence electron shell. So let me start with an example. Okay, so if you look at the periodic table, uh, let's say we're going to use hydrogen. And for hydrogen, you're going to see this in the periodic table. Recall this number at the top, that's its atomic number, which is the number of protons that atom has. And that's also the number of electrons that atom has. So let's say we want to diagram hydrogen. One way we can do that is put H, the element symbol, put a circle around it that represents the first electron shell. Now since hydrogen has one electron, that one electron is going to go into that first electron shell. So we'll draw a little dot to represent that one electron that hydrogen has. So this hydrogen atom here, he is a very unhappy little hydrogen. Why? Because he does not have the one and only thing he wants in his life, which is a filled valence electron shell. Well, let's say there happens to be another hydrogen atom. Okay, this hydrogen atom also has one valence electron. Okay, so he's also an unhappy little hydrogen atom. What can happen is those two hydrogen atoms can get together. So this hydrogen atom over here, he comes and he brings his valence electron. And this hydrogen atom over here, he comes and he brings his valence electron. And then they share that pair of valence electrons. Now, by sharing that pair of valence electrons, they now both have what they want. They have a filled valence electron shell. Recall that the first electron shell can only hold at most two electrons. Well, this hydrogen has two out of two valence electrons, and this hydrogen has two out of two valence electrons. So by sharing that pair of valence electrons, they now both have what they want, which is a filled valence electron shell. But because they're sharing this pair of electrons, those two hydrogens have to stay attached to each other, and that's a covalent bond. Okay, so a covalent bond is sharing a pair of valence electrons to try to fill the valence electron shell. Now, you could diagram it like this, uh, but uh, you won't normally draw out this whole thing. Sometimes you'll see a diagram like this that would be called the Lewis dot structure. We have the dots just representing the valence electrons they're sharing. But the most common way you'll see this drawn is like this, okay, with a solid line. That solid line means a covalent bond, okay? It means they're sharing a pair of valence electrons. Okay, so that's one example. Let's do another example together. So again, if we go to the periodic table, let's say we look up carbon. If you look on the periodic table, this is what it's gonna say for carbon. Okay, so carbon has an atomic number of six, which means it has six protons, and it means it also has six electrons. So let's say I wanna diagram carbon. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the C for carbon, and then I'm gonna draw the dots around it, that Lewis dot structure. Now, when you draw the dots for the electrons, you actually do not draw every electron. What you draw is the valence electrons. So if carbon has six total electrons, what's gonna happen is two are gonna go into the first valence electron shell and then it's full. So that leaves four left over, which are now gonna go into the second electron shell. So I'm gonna draw those four valence electrons that carbon has. Okay, so here's carbon here, and he's got his four valence electrons. So carbon's a very unhappy little atom. He doesn't have the only thing he wants in his life, which is a filled valence electron shell. Okay, well let's say along wanders a hydrogen atom. We call the hydrogen as one valence electron. So hydrogen comes along, and what hydrogen does is hydrogen is gonna share his valence electron with carbon. Okay, now hydrogen is happy. He has what he wants, two out of two valence electrons. But carbon, he's still not satisfied. 
Okay, he had four out of eight. Now he has five out of eight. So he's still an unhappy little carbon. So I guess depending upon your own personal ethics, carbon, he's either polyamorous, polygamist, or he's a little slut. <laughs> and what he's gonna do is he's gonna go find another hydrogen atom, and that hydrogen's gonna share his valence electron. Okay, so now this hydrogen's happy, two out of two valence electrons. This hydrogen's happy, two out of two valence electrons. This carbon, still not happy, six out of eight valence electrons. So he's gonna go find another hydrogen atom to share a valence electron, and another hydrogen atom to share a valence electron. Now, finally, carbon is happy. Everybody is happy. Each hydrogen has two out of two valence electrons, and carbon finally has eight out of eight valence electrons. The more common way you would see that drawn is with the lines. Okay, so the carbon is gonna form four covalent bonds, to four hydrogen atoms, okay? And you don't need to know that, this is methane gas, but that's how it would form those covalent bonds. Okay, so what this means is that different elements are gonna form different numbers of hydrogen bonds, depending on how many unpaired electrons, or that's a more formal way of saying it, or the number of electrons they need to fill their valence electron shell. So since hydrogen has one valence electron, and it needs two, it's gonna form one covalent bond. Whether it's hydrogen with hydrogen or hydrogen with carbon, every hydrogen forms one covalent bond. Carbon has six total electrons, so it has four valence electrons. So it's missing four electrons, so it's gonna form four covalent bonds. This could be with hydrogens, or it could be with carbons, or it could be with oxygens, it can be with different atoms, but it will always form four covalent bonds. Okay, another example, oxygen. If you look on the pair table for oxygen, uh, this is what you're gonna see. <clears throat> so oxygen has eight total electrons. So how many valence electrons does it have? That's right, six. Two go in the first shell, six go into the second shell. So how many more does it need? Yep, two. It needs two more valence electrons. So oxygen will always form two covalent bonds. It could be like oxygen could form two covalent bonds that like, like a hydrogen and a carbon. Okay, or it could form two covalent bonds to another oxygen atom. That's called a double covalent bond. What that means is they're sharing two pairs or four total electrons. It's rare, but you can also get a triple covalent bond. Nitrogen gas, that's the nitrogen that's in the air right now. Actually in the air, the highest percentage gas is nitrogen. It's nitrogen covalently bonded to nitrogen which is covalently bonded by a triple covalent bond. It's sharing three pairs of valence electrons. Okay, so that's what covalent bonds are. They're sharing valence electrons in order to try to fill their valence electron shell. Okay, that's covalent bonds. So a molecule consists of two or more atoms held together by covalent bonds. A single covalent bond is sharing a pair, or two total, but a pair of valence electrons. A double covalent bond is sharing two pairs of valence electrons. Next thing to note about atoms is that electrons are attracted to different atoms by different amounts. In other words, electrons like some atoms more than they like other atoms. So for example, oxygen is very electronegative, okay? Which what that means is electrons love oxygen. Electrons want to be with oxygen. Now, carbon and hydrogen are less electronegative than oxygen, and they're about equal in electronegativity. Now, why different atoms have different electronegativities and how you determine that? Take chemistry, okay? We're not going into those details. So for this course, what I need you to know is basically what I diagrammed here. You should know these three atoms, oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. Know that oxygen is very electronegative, which means electrons love oxygen. Carbon and hydrogen are less electronegative than oxygen, and they're about equal in electronegativity. Okay, so just memorize that. The, re the reason behind it, take chemistry, and they'll teach you all those details. Now, this relates back to those covalent bonds. Because remember what a covalent bond is, is sharing a pair of valence electrons. So for example, let's say you have hydrogen with a covalent bond to hydrogen. Okay, that means they're sharing a pair of valence electrons. Now what does sharing really mean? 
What that really means is the electrons are going back and forth between these two atoms. Sometimes the electrons are over here, sometimes the electrons are over here. They're just bouncing back and forth between those two atoms. Now, since these are both the same element, they have equal electronegativities, which means electrons like this hydrogen just as much as they like this hydrogen. So what ends up happening is these two hydrogens share those electrons equally. So literally half the time, 50% of the time, the electrons are over here. And the other half the time, 50% of the time, the electrons are over here. So they're bouncing back and forth between the two, but half the time they're here, half the time they're here. So they're being shared equally. Now, how I diagram this, this is an official way of writing. This is how I write it to make it make more sense to me. Because I'm going to draw those electrons right in the middle of that covalent bond. So that I realize they're being shared equally by those two hydrogens. Now, in contrast, let's say I have oxygen with hydrogen. Okay, well, recall, oxygen is a lot more electronegative than hydrogen. In other words, the electrons like oxygen more than they like hydrogen. So as electrons are being shared by these two, which means, again, they're going back and forth between the two, between oxygen and hydrogen, but the electrons like oxygen more. So they end up staying over here with oxygen more than they end up staying over here with hydrogen. It's kind of like an unfair custody agreement. The kids are over here all week long, but they're only over here every other weekend. Okay. So um, the way I diagram that, again, this is an official way of writing it, but the way I write it is I draw those two electrons by the oxygen. Why? Because they're, hen they're hanging out with the oxygen more often than they hang out with the hydrogen. Okay, so anytime you have two of the same element, like hydrogen with hydrogen, they're sharing the electrons equally. Carbon with carbon, they're sharing the electrons equally. Oxygen with oxygen, they're sharing the electrons equally. Or if you have two that are about equal in electronegativity, like carbon and hydrogen, again, they're sharing the electrons equally. Now, oxygen with hydrogen, they're unequally sharing the electrons. Oxygen with carbon, they're unequally sharing the electrons. The electrons like oxygen more than they like carbon. Okay, so these are all covalent bonds. But obviously, they're not exactly the same. Okay, these bonds up here, they're sharing the electrons equally. These bonds down here, they're sharing the electrons unequally. So, of course, we have names for the two different types of covalent bonds. Those are called nonpolar covalent bonds and polar covalent bonds. Okay, so nonpolar covalent bonds, the atoms share the electrons equally. In polar covalent bonds, one atom is more electronegative, and so the atoms do not share the electrons equally. Okay, so over here, back for a second, all of these over here at the top equally sharing the electrons, those are nonpolar covalent bonds. Okay, so those are nonpolar covalent bonds. These down here, unequally sharing the electrons, <clears throat> those are polar covalent bonds. Recall what's being shared, electrons. Remember what electrons are. They're a subatomic particle that has a negative electrical charge, like a minus one electrical charge. So let's say we draw polar covalent bonds. We have oxygen here with hydrogen. The electrons are over here more often. They're not over here as often. So what that means is that oxygen, since it has the electrons more often, it has the negative electrical charges more often. So that oxygen ends up building up a partial negative electrical charge. Since the hydrogen does not have the electrons as much, it doesn't have those negative charges as much, it ends up building up a partial positive electrical charge. Okay, so this is supposed to be the lowercase Greek letter delta. In science, we're using that for partial. So partial negative electrical charge on the oxygen, partial positive electrical charge on the hydrogen. Okay, so whenever you have a polar covalent bond, one end of the bond is going to get a partial negative electrical charge. The other end of the bond is going to get a partial positive electrical charge. Okay, so instead of just looking at a bond, let's actually look at a molecule. The molecule you're most familiar with, water, H2O. So with water, it has two hydrogen atoms covalently bonded to an oxygen atom. Now, oxygen is a lot more electronegative than hydrogen, so this is going to be a polar covalent bond. The electrons are going to hang out with the oxygen more than they're going to hang out with the hydrogen. What that means is the oxygen is going to build up a partial negative electrical charge, and the hydrogens are going to build up a partial positive electrical charge. Okay, so this is one water molecule. That water molecule is a polar molecule. 
which means one end of the molecule is a partial negative electrical charge, the other end of the molecule is a partial positive electrical charge. Okay, so that's a water molecule. But whenever you have water, you don't have one water molecule. You know, like your glass of water has got trillions of water molecules inside it. So let me draw another water molecule here. Again, it's going to be oxygen. Again, it's going to be covalently bonded. It's two hydrogens. Again, it's going to be uh, polar covalent bonds. Again, the hydrogen is going to get partial positive electrical charges. And again, the oxygen is going to get partial negative electrical charge. Now, something to note with electrical charges. With electrical charges, opposites attract. In other words, a positive electrical charge and a negative electrical charge, they're drawn towards each other. They want to stick together. Two of the same repel each other. Two positives push away from each other. Two negatives push away from each other. It's not the exact same physics property, but the easiest way to think about it is magnets. Okay, I can almost guarantee all of you at some time in your life played with magnets. Okay, take the north pole of a magnet and the south pole of another magnet and bring them close to each other. They'll stick together. Now take that magnet and flip it around, try to push the two north poles together, and they physically repel, push away from each other. Two south poles, they push away from each other. But a north and a south, they stick together. Okay, same thing happens with electrical charges. A positive electrical charge, a negative electrical charge, they're drawn towards each other and they want to stick to each other. Well, that's also true for partial positive and partial negative electrical charges. So, this partial negative electrical charge in this oxygen is attracted to this partial positive electrical charge in the hydrogen. And that attraction forms your next type of bond called a hydrogen bond which I'm diagramming with, these, with this dashed line here. Okay, so hydrogen bonds are the attraction between partial negative and partial positive electrical charges. They can happen between polar molecules, like water here. So water molecules stick to each other. We're, and we're going to learn a lot about that in the next chapter, because cha the next chapter, chapter 3, is an entire chapter about water. Okay, why we're going to spend a whole chapter on water, I'll teach you about in the next set of video lectures. Okay. <clears throat> So that's two types of bonds we talked about so far. Covalent bonds, which is both polar and nonpolar covalent bonds, and hydrogen bonds. Okay, the next type of bond I'm going to talk about is called ionic bonds. So let's say we have an atom again. Let's say we're going to start with this chlorine atom here. Okay, so chlorine has 17 positive protons, therefore has 17 negative electrons. It says it has 17 electrons, two will go into the first shell, and then it's full. 8 will go into the second shell and then it's full. That leaves 7 left over to then go into the third electron shell. So chlorine is unhappy. He doesn't have what he wants. The only thing an atom wants, which is a filled valence electron shell. It currently has 7 out of 8 valence electrons. So it needs one more. But chlorine is also very greedy. He's not willing to share to get that last valence electron. Instead, what he's going to do is he's going to steal it from somebody else. So, for example, sodium over here has 11 total protons, therefore 11 total electrons. Two are going to the first shell full, eight going to the second shell full. That leaves one left over, which is in the third shell. So what chlorine is going to do is it's going to steal that valence electron from sodium. Okay, so now chlorine has what chlorine wanted, a filled valence electron shell eight out of eight total electrons in the outermost electron shell by stealing that electron from sodium. Okay, I'll come back to chlorine in a second. Sodium was actually happy about the fact that chlorine stole that electron. Why? Because because sodium had one out of eight valence electrons. Okay, well, when chlorine stole that electron, it no longer has this electron, therefore it no longer has a third electron shell. So by losing this electron, since the second shell is already full, sodium now has a filled valence electron shell, eight out of eight valence electrons. So sodium was happy about the fact that chlorine stole that electron, because now sodium has a filled valence electron shell. So now they're both happy. They both have filled valence electron shells. But remember what happened. You moved an electron. Okay, well, electrons have a negative electrical charge. Let's say we start here with sodium, okay? sodium atom, atoms are neutral. They don't have an electrical charge. So sodium atom has 11 positive protons and 11 negative electrons. Okay, so there's no overall charge because the positives and the negatives cancel each other out. 
Okay, but what happened? Well, chlorine stole an electron. So sodium, now instead of having 11 electrons, now only has 10 electrons. But the number of protons didn't change. So it still has 11 positive protons, now 10 negative electrons, one more positive than negative, so sodium has a full plus one positive electrical charge. Similarly, chlorine over here started out with 17 positive protons, 17 negative electrons. Okay, it added an electron, but the protons didn't change. So now one more negative electron than positive proton. So this will now have a full negative minus one electrical charge. Whenever you transfer an electron, what's gonna happen is you're gonna form a positive charge on one of the atoms and a negative charge on the other atom. Recall what I said, positive and negative electrical charges are attracted to each other. Okay, and that causes your third type of bond called an ionic bond. And that will, that's what causes these two things to stay attached to each other. And that creates sodium chloride or table salt, which we talked about in the first video lecture on chemistry. This is sodium, okay? Why is it sodium? Because it has an atomic number of 11, it has 11 protons. Remember I said the number of protons determines which element it is. Well, this also has 11 protons. So technically, this is also sodium, but they're obviously not exactly the same, okay? This one that has no electrical charge, that's called sodium atom. This one that has an electrical charge, that's called sodium ion. Similarly, this is chlorine because it has 17 protons. Well, this also has 17 protons. Okay, well, this one that's neutral, no electrical charge, is called chlorine atom. This one that has an electrical charge, we call that chloride ion. Okay, so atoms do not have electrical charges. Ions do have electrical charges. Now, if you're really paying attention, you would have noticed I changed the suffix from chlorine to chloride here. If you want to learn those details, take chemistry. We're not going to worry about those details. But overall, ions have electrical charges. There's two types. There's the positive ones and the negative ones. So of course, we have names for them. A cation is a positively charged ion. An anion is a negatively charged ion. And then an ionic bond is the attraction between the anion and the cation. So an ionic bond forms whenever there's a transfer of an electron that creates a positively charged cation and negatively charged anion, which then stick to each other, creating an ionic bond. Um, now, if you're trying to remember these, my trick for I remember which one is which, anion, anion is a negative ion. So that's a negative one. And I just remember the other one, the cation, would be the positive. Or it seems like nowadays everybody loves like cat memes. Well, if you think caps are positive, well, there you go. Or this T kind of looks like a plus sign, so that's the positive one. In these examples where I've been talking about ionic bonds, and also when I was talking in the last chemistry lecture, I talked about table salt, sodium chloride. And maybe it sounded weird to you because I call it table salt, okay? Well, when you're at home, you don't say pass the table salt, you say pass the salt. Why do I call it table salt? Because salt is a category. Salt is not one thing. Table salt is a type of salt. Any ionically bonded compound is a salt. So table salt is a salt because it's an ionically bonded compound. Another salt you might have interacted with in your daily life as an example is uh, Epsom salt. It uses like a soaking aid for sore muscles and other things. I think it's magnesium sulfate, but whatever it is, it is an ionically bonded compound. So all ionically bonded compounds are salts. Okay, so table salt, sodium chloride is a type of salt. So the bonds we've talked about so far, they come in different strengths. The strongest type of bond is called a covalent bond. Okay, and then weaker than that is the ionic bond, and then a good bit weaker than that is hydrogen bonds. Those are the ones we've talked about so far. Whereas one last type of bond we're going to talk about, and it's the weakest type of bond. In fact, it's so weak, we don't usually call it a bond, we call it an interaction. That's called a van der Waals interaction. So we have covalent, ionic, hydrogen, and then van der Waals is the weakest type of bond. Okay, so what is a van der Waals interaction? It is the interaction between non-polar molecules. And what does that mean? Okay, well, here's a couple of examples of molecules. These are methane gas. These are covalent bonds between carbon and hydrogen. Now remember, carbon and hydrogen are about equal in electronegativity. 
What that means is the electrons like carbon just as they like much as they like hydrogen. So the electrons are bouncing back and forth between them, but they're spending an equal amount of time with carbon and hydrogen. So there's no partial negative or partial positive electrical charges on these molecules. Okay, so those are nonpolar molecules. Now by looking at them, there's no inherent reason to think that they would be attracted to each other. For example, with water, it makes sense that water is attracted to other water molecules. Because remember, water is made up of polar covalent bonds, so you get partial positive and partial negative electrical charges. They're attracted to each other to create that hydrogen bond. So polar molecules are attracted to each other, and they can form hydrogen bonds. Okay, well, what about nonpolar molecules? It turns out they are attracted to each other. And that's called a van der Waals interaction. Okay, so honestly, for this class, all you need to know about van der Waals is it's the weakest type of bond, and it's the attraction between nonpolar molecules. But some of you will be interested, well, why are they attracted to each other? Well, this nonpolar covalent bond, remember what that means is the electrons are being shared equally. Half the time they're over here at hydrogen, half the time they're over here at carbon. Well, what's really happening is they're bouncing back and forth between them. Well, let's say you look at a split second. Okay, in that split second, those electrons have to be somewhere. Let's say in that split second, they happen to be over here with hydrogen. That means for that split second, that hydrogen atom is gonna get a partial negative electrical charge. Well, over here, those electrons are also back and, bouncing back and forth between the two. Let's say in the same split second, they happen to be with carbon. That means for that split second, that hydrogen has a partial positive electrical charge. Well, this very temporary partial negative electrical charge is attracted to this very temporary partial positive electrical charge, and that's what a van der Waals interaction is. It is so weak because it's so temporary, because they're moving literally trillions of times per second between this hydrogen and carbon. So it's a very, very weak bond, if it's between two molecules like this. Now, let's say instead of two molecules, let's say you get trillions of molecules added together. In that case, the van der Waals interactions can be add up to be fairly strong. For example, strong enough to hold a gecko on a wall. Okay, geckos can climb on walls not because they have glue on the pads of their feet or little suction cups on the pads of their feet. What they have is millions of little tiny hairs. Those hairs are made out of nonpolar molecules, which are attracted to the nonpolar molecules in the wall. So what holds a gecko on a wall? Van der Waals interaction. Okay, so it's a weakest type of bond, and it's the attraction between nonpolar molecules. Now, <clears throat> this next kind of brief topic is mostly a preview for later chapters, because it's going to be important in later chapters. But it turns out that molecules have a very distinct shape, and their shape determines their function. So the shape they have determines what they can do. For example, every time I draw water, I draw it as this V shape here. Why? Because in reality, water forms that V shape. Okay, it's not a straight line like hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. That doesn't happen, it forms this V shape. Okay, every molecule always has a distinct shape it will form, and shape can determine function. Here's an example of that. Okay, this is a molecule that your body makes. It's called endorphin. You've probably heard about endorphins before. Okay, what do endorphins do? They make you feel good. Okay, the most common way you think about it is like if you go for a long run, that like runner's high, runner's high that you get, is from your body releasing endorphins. Okay, well endorphins are a signaling molecule. That's something we'll learn a little bit about later in the semester. You'll learn a lot more about it if you take like anatomy and physiology. But essentially, it's a molecule that one of your cells makes that tells another cell to change its behavior, do something it wasn't doing before. In the case of endorphin, this signaling molecule, what happens is on the surfaces of your brain cells, let's say this is a brain cell here, you have embedded in the brain cells proteins called receptor proteins. Again, we'll learn about them later in the semester. And these receptor proteins, they basically notice that this signaling molecule in endorphin is here. Okay, in other words, endorphin will, this endorphin will bind or attach to this receptor molecule and then tell the brain cell to change its behavior, do something it wasn't doing, in the case of endorphin, make you feel good. Now, how does that work? Well, it's kind of like a lock and a key. Okay, the shape of this molecule, and let's focus on this part of the molecule right here, the shape of this molecule is like a key and it exactly matches the lock of the receptors on your brain cells. 
and then it tells your brain cells to make you feel good. Okay, well let's say instead of going out for a long run, let's say unfortunately you're driving and you got into a car accident and you're in severe pain. They get taken to the hospital and being in severe pain, what they might do is they might inject you with a bunch of morphine. What does morphine do? It makes you feel much better very quickly. It takes away that pain. Okay, how does morphine work? Well, part of the shape of that molecule is very similar to part of the shape of the endorphin that your body naturally makes. In other words, this key has the same shape as this key. So because of that, it fits inside the same lock. So the receptor proteins on your brain cells that are meant for endorphin, morphine will bind to them and unlock them. In other words, tell your brain cells to make you feel better. Now, this morphine will have a much stronger effect than endorphin would for one reason, because you would never make that much endorphin all at once. They inject you with a bunch of morphine all at once to make you take away that pain very quickly. This is an example of how the shape of the molecule determines its function. All molecules work because of their shape. And we're going to learn details about that later in the semester. So this is a preview for that idea. You don't need to memorize anything about endorphin or morphine. This is just an example to help you understand how it's going to be important in later chapters, the shapes of molecules. Okay, well, how do we get these chemical bonds through chemical reactions? Chemical reactions are the making and breaking of chemical bonds. In the chemical reaction, the starting molecules are called reactants, and the things you end with are called products. For example, this is a chemical reaction that can happen. Hydrogen gas can react to oxygen gas to produce water. So that's a chemical reaction. So in this example, the things you're starting with, hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, those are called the reactants. The things you're ending with, water, those are called the products. That's an example, but most of the time you will have nice little drawings of the atoms and the molecules. Okay, most of the time, how you'll see a chemical reaction diagram is with the chemical equation, like this thing down here. Okay, so in this chemical equation, how you read it, let's start with the one you're familiar with, water. Everyone knows that water is H2O. Okay, well, this two here, what that means is that there are two of the preceding type of atom in that molecule. So if there's no number, it's assumed to be one. So what that means is one water molecule has two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. So two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, that's a water molecule. So that's what this subscript small set downward two means here. Two of the preceding type of atom. So two hydrogens, one oxygen. There's also two before it, that's called a coefficient. That tells you how many of those molecules there are. There are two water molecules. Each of them have two hydrogens and one oxygen. Okay, so that's how you read it. So the way you would read this chemical equation, um, two molecules of hydrogen gas, hydrogen gas is two hydrogens attached to each other by a covalent bond, react with, that's what the plus sign means, oxygen gas, which oxygen is two oxygen atoms attached to each other by a double covalent bond, to produce or to yield, that's what this arrow sign means, to produce or to yield, two molecules of water. Okay, so that's an example chemical reaction. Just as another example, which you don't need to worry about this at all yet, but an example of a chemical reaction we're going to discuss later in the semester when we get to chapter 10, we're going to learn about photosynthesis. Okay, we're going to spend an entire chapter on photosynthesis, so obviously we're not going to go over all the details right now, but in brief summary, this is something that plants can do. What plants do is they take the energy from sunlight and they use that energy to turn carbon dioxide from the air into glucose, which is sugar or food for the plants. Okay, so this is, if you were to summarize photosynthesis down into one chemical reaction, what happens is plants take carbon dioxide from the air plus water from the soil plus energy from sunlight to build glucose and then they release oxygen gas as a waste product, which is good because that's the oxygen in the air that you're breathing right now. Okay, so again, you don't need to memorize this or worry about this right now. This is again a preview for a later chapter, just so you can see another example of a chemical equation. Okay, the one, the, the one that summarizes photosynthesis. Now of note, all chemical reactions are technically reversible. For example, if we go back to this one, hydrogen gas can react with oxygen gas to produce water, or what can actually happen is water can break down into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. So technically all reactions can go in both directions. 
Chemical equilibrium is when the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Again, this is a preview for a later chapter. We're not going to go into the details right now. But let's say you have chemical A and it can be turned into chemical B. That would be the forward reaction. But chemical B can also be turned into chemical A. That's a reverse reaction. When the rate, how fast this is turned into this, is equal to the rate, how fast this is turned into this, that's when you're at chemical equilibrium. Again, preview for a later chapter. Okay, so these two video lectures is your brief introduction to chemistry. Obviously, there's a lot more details about chemistry, which we're not going to cover all those details. That's what a chemistry course is for. But you do need to understand some of the basics of chemistry because living things are built out of chemicals water is a chemical you're mostly water dna is a chemical you need your dna proteins are chemicals carbohydrates are chemicals lipids are chemicals those are the molecules you're built out of which you're going to learn about in chapter five so in order to understand those molecules that you you and your cells are built out of you need to understand the basics of chemistry okay so this has been the basics of chemistry in the next lecture we're going to learn about water why it's so important, why it's so unique, and why it's required for life on this planet. Until then, this has been Dr. Sage.